And it's the pre-show. Welcome, everybody. Ten minutes until we get started. Really more like nine minutes. Am I that far behind today that I'm not sure when the show is starting? I've got uh, chat is up. I've got the bird feeder up, as you can see. Let's do a quick check of cameras. Is that too low? Is it too high? It's hard to tell. I think it's pretty good. It's not awful. It's not like I'm coming out of the top of the... Can come down a little bit more, but it's good enough for what we are doing today. I'll probably look at it later and hate it. So there's that. Uh, ch camera three, camera four, that's good. Uh, camera one with me on there. There we go. That looks good. All right. Hi, hi, hi. Hello. Welcome, folks in the chat room. Welcome, folks on YouTube. If you are watching on YouTube, the live stream will be at professormesser.com slash live. There's a little chat room when you go to that live stream URL. All right. We got some Singer's Soothing Throat Spray, Citrus and Honey. I think we're okay now. I think it's all right. I was watching the birds earlier. Not much going on now on the live stream at birdfeeder.live. What happens? Uh, any birds? It is 62 degrees outside. It's a little bit warmer in my studio. I'm going to have to turn the air conditioner on at some point here. We might as well get that ready. All right. We got the, the setup there with the nest so I can control it from my desk. Um, everything else looks pretty good here in the studio. <clears throat> Socrative is up. That's running. Uh, we can see down here the Cylons are going, so we are recording video. I'm recording on the TriCaster and recording on the Internet. That's tree tings that we are recording on, so that's, a, that's in good shape. Uh, what else do we have to do? I think that's close to being it. going to make myself comfortable. There is... Um, I got the studio fixed up a little bit while you've been gone. These these monitors got pushed back a little. I've now put all my screens on arms. I don't know why I didn't do that a long time ago, as much as I moved these monitors around. So now I've got plenty of room to pull the laptop in closer. Got plenty of room for the other view here. I've got one other display that's over here. It's actually a 19, it's designed to go into a 19 inch rack. And so I've got it on a rack stand that's sitting on my desk. I would love to have that on an arm that I could pull up to the side and maybe put right here. It would be awesome. Um, but I can't find anything that would do that. I find a lot of things that would take a 19 inch monitor that has a visa visa attachment um, and would put it in a rack. But this screen that I have here, um, it's not a standard video screen. It does not have a visa attachment in the back. So, oh, Jason Starr, 1953, passed the Security Plus, right on. Nice job. Congratulations. You did the hard part. I'm just making videos, brother. I'm just doing whatever it is we're doing here. Um, what else do I need on this screen? I think we're good here. I'm waiting for the update. Should come in 30 seconds for... Facebook and Twitter. Let's have our Twitter stream up so we can see that. We've got uh, everything else ready to go, I think. I think, I think. I think we're ready. Scrative is there. Why, thank you. It is, a, it is a nice setup. It's worked well for me. It's actually a new iMac in front of me I got uh, two days ago. Got on Monday. It's fantastic. So we are really going to be rendering some videos now. I'm committed. I'm committed now. There's no going back now. There, uh, there's the update to Twitter. Emails have gone out. Facebook has been informed. It's now us, folks. Oh, there's a little bird. Hi, little bird. Oh, there he went away. Little Finch came by. He must have heard me. Can't hear me. Must have heard what was going on. So I've got to figure out, maybe somebody else has taken a monitor designed for a 19-inch rack and found a way to put a visa mount. What I really need is just one single piece of metal, and in the back is a visa mount. 
That's all I need. And then I can put it on the 19 inch here. It's a very light, it's like an inch, not even an inch thick. It's a very small, thin screen. So anyway, the, the screen above my mixer, this one here, this one over to the left is strobing. That's very possible. And it's definitely something relating to refresh rates. I don't know what the refresh rate is for that one. It may be 60 hertz, maybe 30, no, maybe 60 would be 30 LCD screen below the large the one that's in front of me is that the one oh hello I got a friend there how you doing there we go um oh the little ones down here is that what you're referring to I don't know we're like <laughs> like plenty of we're pointing how many screens are in front of me one two three four five six seven which of these seven screens are you referring to ah <laughs> uh, so we've got the TriCaster screen, which interestingly enough is the same one as the very strip of the big monitor that you see the bottom of behind all of this. You've got my primary display in front of me, which is iMac. We've got a secondary iMac display, the other 27 inch to the right. I've got smaller monitors down here for the preview and the program that you see. And I use those to reference while we're going on. We've got iMac, or excuse me, iPad. We've got MacBook. We've got a little bit of screens going back and forth here. So we've got plenty going on. Three minutes. It's already getting warm in here. These LED lights are not like uh, incandescent. But boy, when you get everything running in here, all the equipment and everything else, you can really feel it. So we're going to turn the air conditioning on for just a moment. Oh, it's going to be in the 80s next week. Winter is over. How did that happen? All right. How, how are we doing on time, everybody? Uh, here's all these screens. The, probably aren't complaining about that one. And it really may depend on what you're viewing as well. Actually, the screen that I'm seeing, the video that I'm seeing is very different than what you're seeing. The video that I'm seeing is also going to YouTube. They are recompressing and reformulating it depending on what type of platform you're on. So you may be getting the 720p stream, or if you're on a mobile device, you may be getting a smaller resolution. But they take everything, convert it. So during the conversion, you may be seeing things like that happening. How are we on time? Two minutes. Two, two minutes. And we're good. We are so good. Yes, here in Florida, the weather, uh, Friday, high is 80. Next Tuesday, 81. So there you go. We'll be in shorts here in the studio working on whatever it is we're going to be working on. I know what we're working on. We'll scream right above TriCaster Show, two iMacs or not. Well, that's entirely possible. These little tiny screens are probably, who knows? They're not strobing here. They're not actually strobing on my monitor screens either. But whenever they do the video conversion at YouTube, that's entirely possible. But you don't see that during the study group anyway. So you're in pretty good shape. We've got about a minute to go, just under. Um, what do I need to put up here? I need to put a presentation. I need to put some things on the screen. There we go. There we go. Now we're in good shape. <clears throat> All right, everybody, let's get ready to start a stream. I got about 30 seconds where I can, you know, turn off phone noises, double check recordings. Voice is pretty good. Let's see. I think we're ready. I think we can do this thing. Uh, if you're not on professormesser.com slash live, that's the best place to sit, watch the video, do the chat, all the instructions for getting the questions on Socrative. They're all there. We'll go through it all, of course, when we get to that part of the live stream. Let's do this thing, peoples. Here we go. Welcome to the February 2018 Professor Messer Network Plus Study Group. Hi, everybody. I'm James Messer. I'll be your host during this one hour of Network Plus q and I've got plenty of questions to go through. We will be very busy 
going through all these questions. It's something that we do every month. We sit here and go through all of these. You can, of course, go through all of the replays on my website at ProfessorMesser.com. We'll talk more about all those things on the website in just a moment. Uh, we're also on Twitter. We're also on YouTube. We're on Instagram. You just type in ProfessorMesser.com slash the name of the thing you want to go to, slash Twitter, slash YouTube, slash Instagram, and slash vouchers, where you don't have to spend the full price on your vouchers. There's a 10% 10, 10 discount on any CompTIA voucher on my website, ProfessorMesser.com slash vouchers. So that would be something you might want to consider as well. I'm able to do these study groups thanks to you with your support. Thank you so much for everything that you do throughout the month. Of course, all of my videos are available to watch every minute of every video. Watch it for free. No registration, no payments, nothing required from you. I don't want to know your name. I don't want to know your email address. I don't ask for any of those things. You can just go to my website and watch them, ProfessorMesser.com. You can also purchase an offline version that comes with audio versions. It comes with my course notes. You can find that at ProfessorMesser.com slash GetNetPlus. Also, don't forget about the Network Plus q and I take a lot of the questions from older study groups, and I make them available on some quizzes online. You can find those at ProfessorMesser.com slash popquiz. Hundreds of questions there that might help you with your N10006 exam. If you prefer to have an audio version of this replay, something that will show up automatically in whatever pod, podcaster catching program listening app you like, you can go to professormesser.com slash podcasts. And uh, thousands of you every month listen to this. Thank you so much for your support there. That's just something, another thing that's available, no costs, nothing uh, you have to put out for that one. Just add it to your podcast list. You can also listen from that page at professormesser.com slash podcast. There's a player right there on the screen that you can use as well. well let's talk about Network Plus because we're getting to an interesting part of the month. We're at uh, the middle of of uh, February. It's February 14th. It's Valentine's Day. Who knew? There is plenty to talk about. I'm going to go to the CompTIA website right now while we're talking about this because I looked yesterday and there was no announcement of any new exam that would be coming. And even on the CompTIA website right now, the only exam listed is the N10006. This is the version of the exam that's been available since February the 28th of 2015. But we know the CompTIA tends to update these exams about every three years. Now, it's not to the day. It's not like clockwork. It's plus or minus a couple months around three years. So they have gone three years and a number of months before this has happened. Now, in the past, there have been rumors. I think things that CompTIA has even said is they were shooting to make this new exam, the N10007, available in March of 2018. So we're waiting to hear some type of notice or announcement that that's happening. So we know it's coming. We just don't know the exact day. It doesn't matter if you take the N10006 exam or the N10007 exam, you earn exactly the same Network Plus certification. Also, when they release a new exam, they don't just turn off the old exam. They usually give about a six-month ramp there, six-month overlap, where you could take either exam. I mean, how horrible would it be if you were studying for months and then a new exam came out and you couldn't take the thing you were studying for? Nobody wants that. So they give you plenty of time, and that's why I tell people, start studying right now. I The the N10006 and the N10007 exam objectives are available for download on the CompTIA website, so we know there must be a new one coming at some point. I've already gone through them. I've already created my course. I'm just waiting for them to... To, uh, uh, to actually launch it, um, there's not much difference between them. So if you were to study the N10006 right now, and then later on you thought, maybe I'll take the newer exam, you're in great shape because practically nothing was dropped from the exam, very little. Uh, there's there's maybe a 10% difference, 20, maybe 15% difference. I would not say 20. In fact, 15 seems long. So we we don't know when this exam is coming. Uh, CompTIA just hasn't said. So we'll see. We'll see what happens on the website. We'll just keep checking back and see where that's going. CompTIA hasn't said yet. So you can expect it, though. It'll be, it'll be out there eventually. 
And as I said, not much of a difference. So don't expect there to be this amazing new exam. It will be exactly the same exam as the ATIT 006 with a couple of new things in it. Not a huge dramatic difference in those two. We're going to do Q&A today. So whenever we do that, we know there's going to be something interesting going on with Q&A. So let's all figure out how to get to the Q&A. We're going to find that on Socrative.com. An easy way to get there is just go to ProfessorMesser.com slash QA. I put that link on the main screen so you'd be able to see that. Uh, it's one of those things that is available for you to look at right now. Um, if you go to ProfessorMesser.com slash QA, there will even be something on the screen there waiting for you a question that's available. I have it right here. So if you go to ProfessorMesser.com slash QA, you'll see this question there. This is actually from last month. So if you studied, if you were here last month, you'll remember this question, you'll get it right. Or maybe you know this question, but this is a way for us to test to see if you're really able to get into Socrative and answer this question. And the question is, which of the following would be the best use of IEEE 1905.1? The possible answers are, if you make it to Socrative, you will see this. Is it to prevent loops on a switched network? Is it to connect two remote sites over 10 gigabit Ethernet? Is it to connect multiple VLANs across switches? Is it to connect multiple home network types together? Or is it to require authentication before gaining access to the network? Now, if you were here last month, or you listened to the replay, or you know all about the N10006, then you probably know the answer to this one. Let's, in fact, what happens as you're answering them, I get to see the results in real time compiling on this side. And now you can see it as well. Normally, I don't show this live as we're going through it. But you can see right now, 54% of you say connect multiple home network types together. I've got a number of you that have said almost a tie for second between connecting remote sites over 10 gig, connecting multiple VLANs, and requiring authentication before gaining access. Only 3% said prevent loops on a switch network. Maybe you guys have remembered that one. We're obvious, obviously here referring to IEEE 1905.1. I'll talk about that in just a moment. The important thing is that you're able to see the question. You're able to answer the question. You should be able to do that from professormesser.com slash QA. If you're using your Socrative app, you can download a student app for your mobile device. And they ask for a room name. The room name is Professor Messer, P-R-O-F-E-S-S-O-R-M-E-S-S-E-R. -S -S -E Make sure you spell it right or you won't see any question that's there. 1905.1, that's all about networking in the home. So that's where that absolutely came from. Uh, the multimedia over coax, 802.11 wireless, Ethernet, power line networking, make them all work together using IEEE 1905.1. It is not a technology that seems to have caught on. Not a lot of people implementing IEEE 1905.1 into their devices. And I want to say that 1905.1, it may be one of those rare things that is not going to be on the N10007. But it's still nice to have and nice to know you're going to run across this on one of these pieces of equipment in your house. It will mention IEEE 1905.1. The problem is you need all of them to mention IEEE 1905.1. So that's where that came from. So if you did answer D, then you got that one absolutely right. So let's, now that you've tried it out, you've gone through the Socrative, you've gotten familiar with the interface, now you know what to expect, let's do some questions. One of the things you may not realize is that the exam that you're going to take for Network Plus is not just multiple choice. You may get, you're, there's going to be a lot of multiple choice questions, but the first section of questions you get on the exam are anything but multiple choice. They might be fill in the blank. They might be matching. They might ask you to put things in a particular order. They might pop you on to a, a command prompt and tell you to perform a particular function at the command line. So that may be a simulation capability. It may be any one of these types of questions. Now, all of these come from the exam objectives. So if you know your exam objectives, it won't really matter how they ask the question. But they call these performance-based questions. You get a bunch of them right at the beginning of the exam. There may be a handful, probably five, maybe less, maybe more, somewhere in there. We don't know how many points they're worth. Nobody knows. 
how many points there were. So this is one where it doesn't it it doesn't don't worry about how much are they worth. You want to worry about do I know what's really contained in these questions? What I sometimes will even recommend people to do, this is what I do. With CompTIA exams, you can jump to any question at any time. I jump over the performance-based questions because I just can't handle it first thing on the exam. I need to settle in a little bit. I need the adrenaline to stop. I need the anxiety to go down a little bit. So I go through the multiple choice questions first. And in fact, the multiple choice questions will jog my memory on things that may help me later on. So once I go through all the multiple choice, I then go all the way back to the beginning and go through the performance-based questions. That might be a good strategy for you. Some people don't like to do that. It really depends on your style. But to say all of that, let's start the study group with a performance-based question. You can't jump over this one. There's no way to go back <laughs> in the study group. So here is your performance-based question of the day. And it is, name these connectors. I've got an A, a B, a C, and a D. And this, I'm not giving you any multiple choices on this one. I'm not even matching it. You have to fill in the blank. Tell me what A is. Tell me what B is. Tell me what C is. Tell me what D is. That's what I'm looking for. Do not answer in the chat room. None of these should be answered in the chat room. You should instead go to professormaster.com slash QA and put them right in there. So put an A, B, C, and D. And I'm waiting for your answers. And don't Google those. You don't want to, I don't think you could Google this one because some of these are not quite right with the Googling, with, uh, with finding them, with the name of what these things are. So some of you are pretty good at these. I'm watching a few of the answers come in. Some of you are pretty good at IDN. I think everybody's getting the first one pretty well. The second one, hmm. Not, not as good. The third one, pretty good. The fourth, I think the B and the D are going to give us some problems, aren't they? We're going to have to figure those pieces out as we go through them, through them. Hopefully, you know what these connectors are, the A, B, the C, and the D. Now, these are things you have to know on the exam. All of these come directly from the exam objectives. CompTIA expects that you are going to be able to look at interfaces, to look at cables, and you will recognize what those are. Perhaps even more importantly, they will want you to know what to do with those. So I'm giving you a pretty easy question considering what you might get on the exam. CompTIA might give you a list of a number of different uh, applications of these technologies and would tell you, how can I match the application of the technology to the connector type? That, that might be a common, that would be a pretty good one. And if you can look at a connector and go, oh, I know what uses that connector. It uses voice or video or data or high-speed networking or wide area networks or whatever it happens to be. You think you know how that particular technology is used, you're in pretty good shape. Let's go through these now. We've had a number of people answer. I see some more. I want a few more to come in. You folks are Googling madly. I know that when they'd slow. I Remember, I see this in real time on my side. It's really slow. And then all of a sudden, I get a lot of answers in. Let's see how we did with this one. Let's start with with the first one here. So let's name these connectors. The first one, number A, is, let's see, can, can we even see that on my screen? I think we can't. So A would be, almost everybody got this one, a BNC connector. This is not a coax connector, although the type of cable that often is used with, almost always used with BNC, not always, most of the time with BNC, is a coax connector. So that's one where you might often see this. And you, when would you use BNC? You would see the BNC connectors. Uh, they're the kind that push in and they twist to lock. So that's why you often see that being used on something. You don't want that to easily pop out. So it locks in place. Very common to see this on DS3 WAN links. So if you've got a T3 or a DS3 connection coming in, very common to use coax for that. Um, and that coax connector almost always going to have a BNC on the end. You might often see these in other uses, too. BNC is not limited to just networking. You can sometimes see it on video connectors. I have BNC connectors on the video type technology I use in the studio, which is not HDMI. It's a completely different scenario. Everything is coax connected with video in here. So that's one that you often see. Now, B, I don't think everybody got B exactly right. B is an LC connector. So that LC, a little bit smaller than what you would find with SC. 
In fact, you see it has these tiny little connectors on it plug in. Now, you have to have some context to this. And I didn't put a lot of context in the picture other than having the transceiver there. So if you're used to that SFC transceiver and you know the size that that is, you should be able to get the context of the LC that's there. Definitely has the left and right associated with it. And there's a transceiver right next to it. Doesn't have anything plugged into it. So it gives you a little bit of context with that one. Let's do another one. The next one is an F, F connector. That's what you expect to see on cable television. That's probably the only time you'll see that one used is on cable type connections, cable television, cable modem, cable data, cable voice, cable video. And the F connector has those screws. So it screws in. So when you have to remove an F connector, this is me removing an F connector. I'm screwing it. All right, is that it? No, I screwed some more. OK, let's pull up. No, that's not. Unscrew it some more. How long is this thing? Screw it some more. No, that's OK, finally it comes off. That's me with an F connector. So the, I hate F connectors. But they're not going anywhere. This is why cable, they use this for cable. Because you don't want to get a call from someone at home saying the video is awful or it's, the video went out and the cable, it turns out the cable fell off. An F connector is not going to fall off. So here we go. Last one, the D is FC. FC connectors, which you don't see much anymore on the fiber side. It is part of the N10006. I think this is another topic, though, that may have been dropped from the N10007. I don't think there were FC connectors on there. And that makes sense. This is what CompTIA does, of course, in these exams. I always hear people saying, these exams are so outdated. And I wonder, what are you talking about? These exams always stay up to the latest of what's going on. Because FC the, has probably has kind of faded out. They're, bi they're relatively big connectors compared to the something like an LC. And so manufacturers don't want to put these big connectors on because it takes up space where they could be putting much more interfaces on to have that there. So it makes sense for what you're doing and having all those pieces available. Uh, for those in the chat room, Windows Vista is not on the Network Plus exam. So if you're studying Windows Vista for the exam, boy, you're wasting your time on that one. Uh, what about cable modems? They're outdated and still covered. Uh, cable modems are not outdated. We're using cable. There are millions of cable modem installations, including the one that you're using to listen in on this podcast, the podcast and the video stream. So thank goodness for cable modems, or we would not be able to use that. Oh, and you mean dial-up modems. Well, I'll tell you what. You would be surprised how much dial-up is in use today. There is an enormous amount of dial-up in use. In fact, there is a, a huge amount of dial-up, especially in retail. On these, if you have a, a hundreds and hundreds or even thousands of locations, uh, makes a lot of sense to have some type of backup, and in some cases, uh, dial-up modem is your only choice. It's remarkable how much you really get into doing serial communication, having that dial-up connection. And that'll save you when that internet goes down. Absolutely there. So pretty important to know that technology, too. So hopefully you got these right. BNC, LC, F, and FC. So if you're watching on the pod, listening on the podcast, this was not any help for you at all. You listened into the last 10 minutes and didn't help you a bit. I'm so sorry. But watch the, watch the video stream. And you'll be able to see some of these connectors. You can put some of these together. Let's do a question that my podcast listeners can enjoy at this point. Here we go. The question is, as I change it on Socrative, which of these best describes the difference between a vulnerability scan and a penetration test? Which of these best describes the difference between a vulnerability scan and a penetration test? Is it A, a vulnerability scan is used on test systems, a penetration test is used on production systems? Is it B, a vulnerability scan is performed by internal technicians, and a penetration test is performed by a third party? Is it C, a vulnerability scan identifies vulnerabilities, a penetration test exploits vulnerabilities? Is it D, a vulnerability scan is used on a local subnet, penetration is used across an internet connection? And E, a vulnerability scan is associated with network equipment, and a penetration test is associated with operating systems? Those are very long-winded answers, aren't they? Kind of unaccustomed to seeing that, but you will see some questions on the exam that go through a lot of these long-winded questions and answers as well. Sometimes the the question is very long. I have some of those in the study group as well. Hopefully, you know all about vulnerability scans and penetration tests. Those are absolutely covered 
on both the N10006 and the N10007 exam. So maybe you happen to know the difference between those two. If you happen to, go to professormesser.com slash QA, and you'll be able to answer this one and have those there. So hopefully that's one you've run into. Maybe you've even done some vulnerability scanning and penetration testing. If you have not, I highly recommend that you do some of this hands on, see it in person, understand what it's doing, and then you're ready for the exam. Try to get as much hands on as possible before you walk in the door. And with networking, it helps not just a, not saying plug in the cables to the switch and configure it, but on a lot of these uh, command prompts that they give you and a lot of the technologies like vulnerability, vulnerability scans and penetration tests, so easy to load up some software. There's a lot of free software out there, and you can do it yourself. There's also a lot of labs out there that can also help you and get those there. So hopefully that's one that you've worked through. Let's see how we did on describing the difference between a vulnerability scan and a penetration test. And 86% of you have said a vulnerability scan identifies vulnerabilities and a penetration test exploits vulnerabilities. Or is that reversed? Did I trick you? Let's find out because it's pretty much a tie for all the others that are there. It's 4%, 4%, 5%, 2%. 4, 4, 5, and 2 and 85% for everything else. So is that really what's there? Let's talk about penetration testing, what people call a pen test. This is when the good guys are attacking your systems. This is sort of like vulnerability scanning, but when you're actually performing the penetration test, you're trying to exploit these vulnerabilities that might exist in these operating systems and other devices. This is something that a lot of places they have to do every X number of months, once a year. It's a requirement to be able to maintain compliance with uh, either internal rules or rules that are laws, regulations that may apply to your organization. There's a nice guide that, that NIST.org has put together if you wanted to go through and look at that. There's a very long URL, but if you just Google something along the lines of technical guide, information security, testing and assessment, you will find this. And a lot of people in the chat room, people say, that's the job I want. Um, unfortunately, not a lot of jobs for penetration testers in, in information technology and information security. There are probably an estimated 1.1 million jobs in IT security in the United States. There are probably about 300,000 open recs right now. Huge number of open recs. There's not enough people in security right now. Uh, the number of penetration testers in there, very, under 100,000. Very small group of penetration testers. This will be something that you will do as part of your normal IT job. So you will not be a penetration tester who wanders the globe and tries to break into people's networks. As awesome as that sounds, that's not really a very common job. What you'll commonly do is work on installing new firewall technologies, implementing it into your network, setting up reporting from all of your security systems, monitoring your IPS, addressing IPsec VPN and creating new connections to partners, implementing SSL VPNs with third-party verifications, being able to set up a single sign-on capabilities, perhaps even through a third party in the cloud. Those are the normal IT security jobs. Pen testing, unfortunately, is not one of those normal jobs. Are there pen testing jobs out there? Absolutely. If it's something that interests you, absolutely go for it. But you may find that the market is very niche. So you should strive to be the best you can be when it comes to penetration testing. All right, that's, that's enough of me talking about penetration testing. Let's talk about something else. So those of you that did, uh, that did do this, there you go. There's the you did get it right. C is correct. The vulnerability scan does identify vulnerabilities. A penetration test does exploit those vulnerabilities. Two very different things. You need to understand both and be able to do both for that type of thing. Let's, let's do another question. I've got another question here. Another multiple choice. This should help you. So the question is, the CRC counter on your computer's network interface is increasing over time. Which of these would be the most likely reason? Would it be A, network utilization is high, B, the network has a loop, C, the destination device is down, D, the default gateway is faulty, 
or E, the network cable is bad. One of those would be the most likely reason for the CRC counter on your computer's network interface to be increasing over time. Make sure you understand the question that's being asked of you on these exams. In fact, there could possibly be, even in this answer, not saying there is, but there could, and it certainly could be this way in your exam, many, many answers in here could technically be a reason that a CRC counter might be increasing over time. But that wasn't the question. The question was, which of these would be the most likely reason? So you do have to understand what the differences are between all of these different technologies, how they're implemented, and which ones would be the most common situation. Now, I'm looking at this and thinking, there could possibly, depending on your network configuration, at least be three of these answers that could apply. There you go. That's my my technical breakdown of these answers. So now that I've got it narrowed down to three, which of those three would be the most likely reason? You have to know what those most likely reasons might be. That is a very common type of question you will get on the exam. I'm going to take a sneak peek and see how we're doing with these. Pretty good. What I try to do with these questions is get about 50% of you to get these questions right. What I'm really trying to say is I'm trying to get 50% of you to get this question wrong. I'm trying not to ask you questions you already know, in other words. I want to ask you questions that's going to make you think. There are usually two steps to a question. This is probably our first two-step question. The last couple were not. The last couple were more of definition questions. This is more along the lines of what you might see on the exam, if I must say. Let's see. I'm waiting for a certain number of people to answer this. Let's see. While you do that... I'm going to take a sip from a warm beverage in an attempt to speak a little better into the microphone. Let's discuss this particular answer. Let's see how we did. How do we do? 85 of you have answered already. Uh, if you want to answer, go to professormesser.com slash QA. That's your login for Socrative, where 35% of you said the network utilization is high. 27% of you have said the network cable is bad. 16% of you said the network has a loop. And it's a tie for fourth between the destination device is down 10% and the default gateway is faulty. That's 11%. So you've got no specific, no majority here has decided that that's the right answer. The best we've got is maybe the top two. Maybe the top three, network utilization is high, network cable is bad, the network has a loop. If we went with the, the largest number, it would be 35% of you. A third of you have said network utilization is high, just over a third. So what would be causing these CRC counters to begin increasing on the network? What would be the most likely reason for something like this? Well, glad you asked because a big part of your exam is about troubleshooting. And troubleshooting interfaces. You're going to troubleshoot interfaces on switches, on routers, on intrusion prevention systems, on workstations, because they're going to tell you your network is slow, and you need to figure out why they think your, my network is slow. So if you see any type of error on your interface, and I've got a list of them here that are taken from the switch that's here in my studio. It's alignment errors, FCS errors. You need to know what those frame check sequence errors are. Single collision frames, multiple collisions frames, and on and on and on. Late collisions, symbol errors. These are errors at this layer one type scenario. We're worried about the signal that's coming through. So errors that you're seeing on the interface is the interface not being able to interpret what it's getting across the network. That'd be a certain type of problem. So you want to be sure to check configurations, like how is the speed configured on both sides? How is the duplex configured on both sides of this connection? Are, is somebody on the right VLAN for this connection? Although that probably wouldn't give you a physical type of error. But those are the type of things, if you're, if you're looking and trying to confirm, is this set up right? That's certainly one of those things that you would look at. Look at. You want to look at traffic in both directions, two-way communication, and see what the end, end connectivity might be. Now, if you see a type of problem associated with any of these, especially these lower level physical troubleshooting interface problems like alignment errors, FCS errors, which are your the frame check sequence is the CRC 
error that you would see on the switch. It's called an FCS error, but you'll probably see it called a CRC in your operating systems because that's what it's using to calculate that particular error. Collision frames, especially late collision frames, which may be related to duplex instead of something else. But when you run into these types of problems, you know you have some type of physical problem on the network with the cabling. And if we look at our answers, 35% of you said network utilization is high. A CRC error means that the frame came into the adapter and it was not looking well. It was scrambled up. It didn't pass the checksum. It, it had some type of issue. The, the frame check sequence did not match the rest of the data. It's a parity check and it said, sorry, this is corrupted. We're not even going to look at this frame. It's a mess. I'm going to drop the frame and I'm going to increment my counter with one particular CRC. But network utilization wouldn't cause a frame to be corrupted. The frame would still get to me eventually. It may be delayed, but it will get to me eventually. The only time we would see frames that are having problems like this might be if there is a half duplex network, which don't exist anymore, by the way. And we might get a collision, but then it would show up as a collision on my list in the collision counter. It would either be a collision, single collision frame, a multiple collision frame, or a late collision. Late collisions are especially bad for many reasons. Uh, but it would not cause a CRC error, not as we're seeing it there. So that would not be the most likely reason, especially today, not the most likely reason because you don't have any half duplex networks anymore. Uh, the network has a loop. Again, we would be seeing a lot of traffic. We'd be overwhelmed with traffic, but all the traffic should be OK. We should be able to look at every frame, and the checksum should check out on every single frame, even as it's coming through at massive amounts. We may be dropping frames, but none are coming through corrupted. Just because the network gets busy, the frames don't somehow become malformed. That doesn't happen. They only become malformed if something else has happened. How about the destination device is down? We are getting no frames then. There's nothing coming in. If you're not talking to that device, you're, you don't get any errors because there's no data whatsoever. So that's not our problem. Default gateway is faulty. That's a possibility if a default gateway is faulty. But it would have to be faulty in a way that you're always communicating to that device and the gateway itself has had a problem with an interface, and that interface is causing the particular problems. But that's not really where you see CRC errors. If you see CRC errors popping up on the screen, you should immediately start thinking about how data is going across the network and your cabling. The network cable is bad. It is probably your that is your 99% of the time, that's your problem with CRCs. The other 1% of the time is your hardware really is going bad. If you have a, a switch interface or an interface that's on an, an Ethernet card and that interface is going bad, then obviously there will be errors associated with that. But 99% of the time, it's going to be a cabling issue. Which of these would be the most likely reason? I'd say the network cable's bad is, is nine. That's it. That is by clearly the most likely reason, 26% of you. Got that one correct, unfortunately. I was shooting for 50, so I failed you on that one. But on the good side, now we know all about CRC errors and work, working through this and having them there. So uh, somebody mentioning, I said in the, in the question that the CRC counter on the network is increasing over time. Well, that's kind of how they increase over time. They increase as time goes on. They go up. Now, maybe it, maybe it would stay constant. But in this particular scenario, we're getting an increasing number of CRC errors. Maybe the cable is pushed up against the desk. And every time some, somebody sits down to work on this problem, they push the desk even harder against the wall and crimp the cable even worse. It's a counter. It's a counter in keeping track of what's going on over time. And the most likely reason, whether it was increasing over time or not, your most likely reason is probably the network cable is bad. So was that extra information? Probably. You'll get a lot of those on the exam, too. But it, that's usually how it works, by the way. Is you, suddenly, it starts off a couple, and then it gets worse. And the next day, it's even worse. The next day, because something's happened with the cable. Maybe they're bending it every time they open the door. You know, it gets worse and worse and worse. So your answer is E, the network cable is bad. 27% of you got that one absolutely right. There is so much 
in this exam? Why is there so much information in this exam? I don't know, but there is. Networking itself is full of acronyms. It's full of specific details about speeds and feeds. It talks about security encryption. There's IPsec tunnels that combines networking and security and crams them together. So many different things associated with it. I've gone through every single one of my videos. I've taken every bit of text and every graphic, and I've stuck it into a document. These are my Network Plus course notes. If you've seen these before, you may not realize these started off. This is the actual start off is 15 pages. The 15 pages thumbnails you see on the screen is where it started. And I said, you know what? That's not good enough. I went back to every video, and I went and looked at every single document, every single slide, and took every bit of information. can't even see that because of the bright lights there. Every bit of text from everything. This is now, this is the printed version of the course notes. This is 65 pages long. So we went from 15 pages. I just added 50 pages to it, 65 pages of course notes. This is the physical version that you can buy. There's also a digital version available. That's not the right screen. That's the right screen. There's a digital version available for $15. Every bit of this money goes back to keeping this craziness around me running doing these live streams, creating new content. So you're not only getting something that I really think is going to help you before you go in to take your exam, but you're also helping to support what we're doing here. There, This is not a replacement for a textbook. This is not a replacement for watching videos. This is not a replacement for getting hands-on or doing Q&A. But when you finish all of those, you just need some, some way to do a Cliff Notes version of what in the world do I need to know. It's all here in this document. There's the... There's good stuff here. I've got all the pictures, every graphic, everything that is listed. So if you're the kind of person who wants more data, this is a lot of data. You're going to like these course notes. Go to professormester.com slash NPCN. You can get the digital version. If you get the printed version, by the way, I give you the digital version for free. So it comes with it. You can download them immediately and start using them. Put, put them on all your mobile devices. Put them on your laptop. Put them on your desktop. Wherever you go, they'll be in front of you. They'll be available. And if you get the book, you'll have something you can take around with you. Yeah, my Security Plus course notes were over 90 pages long. So they're getting bigger and bigger because you've said, I want everything. So now I'm just putting everything in there. So absolutely have a look at those. Uh, and thank you for your ongoing support. Thank you for the people that have purchased these course notes before. Uh, I cannot tell you how much it helps to keep these things going. Uh, we really do appreciate it. And uh, and thank you so much for your continued support. And you're going to gonna have a great time looking through these course notes and going into your exam knowing this content that's on there. It's got to help you. Let's do another question, though. This will also help you. Here's a question that's going to help. Which standard would best describe 10 gigabit Ethernet over Category 6 twisted pair cabling? What's it going to be? Oh, you have to know all these standards for the exam, don't you? So if you think you know, go to professormester.com slash QA. Do not say in the chat room because your possible answers are A, 10G base T, B is 10G base TX, C is 1000 base T, D is 10G base TR, and E is 1000 base TX. Boy, there's a lot there. Let me go through one more time for the folks that are listening in. It's 10G base T, 10G base TX, 1000 base T, 10G base TR, and 1000 base TX. Those are your five possible answers to have it there. Oh, that's someone in chat room is also asking, should I start studying now or wait for the N10007? Never, 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 never wait to get certified. Never, 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 never wait to get certified. Never. You are much more valuable walking into a particular interview situation having that certification in your pocket. And whether you take the N1006 or N1007, you get the same certification. So why would you wait to take a brand new exam that had fewer resources available for you to study, and if you passed it, you ended up getting the same piece of paper as if you had taken the one that everybody has content for that's available today, uh, the N1007 has not even been announced officially by CompTIA. We don't know when it's coming out. So right now, I take that as vaporware. It doesn't exist. I know it's coming. We all know it's coming. But 
I'm saying that if you're planning your life, plan your life around the things that you know are coming, the things that you can bet on. And the N1006 is available right now. And you're not going to take another exam, uh, Network Plus exam. Once you earn your certification, you're just renewing it through other activities. So it doesn't matter which exam you take. You're never taking another one. So why not just take the one that's available? So let's see how we did with this standard that would best describe 10 gig Ethernet over Category 6 Twisted Bear ca Pair cabling. It's Twisted Bear cabling now. It's all about bears. We're going out to Wyoming, and we're putting in networks. Uh, we had 49% of you that said A, 10G base T. 32% of you has said B, 10G base TX. And then we've got maybe a tie for a third with 1,000 base T and 1,000 base TX. And only 3% of you said 10G base TR, probably because I made that one up. 10G base. So we're talking about 10 gigabit Ethernet, which not a lot of people have. I just got one machine in my studio this week with 10 gig on it. So, and I don't have any other 10 gig, so it's running at gigabit. I need to get more 10 gig now. See how this works with me? So now I need all 10. We got to swap everything out, everybody. We all need, we all need 10 gig. No, I don't. I don't need 10 gig. Uh, it would be nice, but I need some type of cabling to be able to cable all this 10 gig together. So there's a number of different options when you're talking about 10 gig over copper. So the one that is the standard that you will most commonly see for copper and 10 gig is 10 G base T. It's a standard that's been around since 2006. This is well, what we call running over a cable that can support 500 megahertz of signal because that's how, that's how the frequency of the the signal is going over the pairs. This is very this is quite an upgrade. And it had to be because we were putting so much more data on these twisted pair cables. We didn't increase the number of pairs. We had to increase something else. We increased the frequency of the data going through this particular cable. Uh, for gigabit Ethernet, it's 125 megahertz, jumped all the way up to 500 because it had to be. The twisted pair cables that you're going to find for gigabit, you will either put in category 6, or these days you're probably putting in category 6A. Uh, the A is for augmented. Category 6 can go 55 meters for a twisted pair. And then category 6A, 100 meters for this. So in the chat room, uh, TX is crossover, right? It is not. Uh, made that one up. It's not a standard. You will see some standards like uh, 1,000 base TX and 1,000 base T. Those are two standards. The letters only loosely describe what the standard means. There's no set rule on those letters that they use for the standard names. It's just whatever the standards committee decided to call it. They could call it tin base flubber. And they, it would mean something for this. Uh, but that's one that you would run into. So 10 G base T is the standard. We're so used to putting the TX on these, though. I could see why people would put 32% of you said 10 G base TX because 1,000 base T, there was a TX version for that. There's 100 base TX. So you run into this all the time to be able to do this. Yes, category six will run 10 gig and lower. It'll do 10 gig at uh, 55 meters. It'll do uh, any, any lower speeds at 100 meters, which are the standard lengths for gigabit. So that'll work too. Of course, you can go down to category 5 and 5E for gig if that's all you need. In my studio, most everything is category 5E because that's all you can get these days. Nobody's making category 5 anymore. They haven't for a very long time. And you will find category 5E, category 6, and category 6A out there that you can buy. And these days, you can find category 7, which is sort of a half standard. There's a, there's a worldwide set of standards, and there's a U.S. set of standards. Uh, the worldwide set of standards does have a Category 7. The U.S. standards do not, at least not yet. But uh, that's one that uh, you'll learn more about on the N10007, I'm sure, should that certification come around someday. So if we look at our possible answers, if you did answer the 10G base T, answer is A, 10G base T, 52% of you got that one absolutely right. Hey, we hit pretty well, that 50% that I was shooting for, unless a lot of you came around after the fact and added, added your answer now that you knew what it was, which I guess you could do.
to be able to do that. That should That's something you can do. Now, remember I told you a lot of these questions on the exam can go on and on and on. Some of them are pretty long. So I tried to do a couple of those for this. So let's do an, a question that's got a little bit more information in it to have it there. And the question is, you're installing a VPN concentrator, and you need to integrate user authentications with your existing directory services. Which of the following would be the best choice for this requirement? Would it be A, IPsec? Would it be B, SSL? Would it be C, Radius? Would it be D, STP? Or would it be E, WPA2? So the question is, you're installing a VPN concentrator, and you need to integrate user authentications with your existing directory services. Which of the following would be the best choice for this requirement? Would it be IPsec, SSL, Radius, STP, or WPA2? If you think you know the answer, go to professormesser.com slash QA. If you don't know the answer, still go to professormesser.com slash QA and take a stab at it. Do not answer in the chat room. I don't want to do that. The interesting part about this question, well, we'll talk more about it in a moment. But I mentioned if you don't know the answer, answer it anyway. Absolutely do that. You should absolutely do that. Uh, as far as we know, we know a number of things about the exam, but CompTIA doesn't share how the exam is graded. But what we think we know is that if you answer a question, you will get points for that. If you guess at a question and get it right, you get points for that. If you don't answer at all, you get no points. If you get it wrong, you get no points. There's no penalty for getting it wrong, in other words. So one of the things that's important is that you're able to read the questions and answer them and don't leave them blank. Never leave any of these questions blank. If you're getting near the end, there's 60 seconds left, and you've got 10 questions left, you know, mark all of them A. Make a Christmas tree. Do something. Put something in those. It could be the difference in you passing the exam and you not. Take a stab. You mark them all A. Maybe statistically you think, well, I got 25%. Because on the real exam, there's usually four answers. So maybe you get 25% of them right. Out of 10 of them, get a couple right. I'll take that. It's better than getting them all wrong. So take a stab as you're going through those. Hopefully, you were able to look at this uh, question and break it down into the most important parts of this question. This is very common on the exam. You need to be able to look at everything on the exam and break apart what they're really asking of you. And if I, if I look at the answers, a lot of you, I think, knew what was asked of you. But a lot of you, I think, jumped at certain words and certain things that were on here and may not have hit the exact point of this particular question. Let's look at how you did with this one. You're installing a VPN concentrator. You need to integrate user authentications with your existing directory services. Which of the following would be the best choice for this requirement? And how do we do? 64% of you said radius. A tie for second at 16% apiece at IPsec. Another 16% said SSL. 4% of you said WPA, and nobody said STP. So the important part of this question is that why you're doing this, the reason for integrating user authentications with your existing directory services doesn't matter. You're installing a VPN concentrator. has nothing to do with the answer, by the way. It's a reason that you would need to do it, but it has nothing to do with the final question. But you see VPN concentrator, and you think, oh, VPN concentrator, IPsec, SSL, we got clients, we're doing host checking. What is it? What are we doing with VPNs? The question I'm actually asking is almost nothing to do with VPNs. It has to do with authentication. You need to integrate user authentications with your existing directory services. That's the question. So what's which one of these would be the best technology to integrate with directory services? Let's see about remote access authentication. Very commonly, you're authenticating through a VPN, SSL. Maybe you're on your network and authenticating. You're logging into a switch. And you need to authenticate to the switch. You're logging into a router. This happens all the time as network administrators. So something we need to do. Can't even see this. I got this big thumbprint on the screen. Can't even see it. Let's send that to the back. Look, now we can, can can't read anything. Let's 
Let's get rid of. I can't. We could sort of read it now. The thumbprint's going to be. It's going to be something we can use to add flavor to the answer. So what we need is something called AAA authentication, authorization, and accounting. That's what we need. And usually there's a server that will provide that authentication capability for us. It's centralized. The benefit here is imagine that you had 100 switches in your network and you're a new administrator. You just joined the group and now you need authentication access to these switches. Nobody wants to log in to 100 switches and set up your username and password. What they want to do is go to one place, the AAA server, set up your authentication there, and then tell the, the switch is already pointing to that authentication server. So the first time you had a switch, it will take your username and password, check in with the AAA server, and be able to tell you exactly what's going on. It's all centralized. It's all perfect. Do it that way. Most commonly, we use a particular set of protocols to make that happen. It's very common to use Kerberos. For example, when you log into Windows, it's Kerberos that is providing that authentication. Sometimes you might have a third-party product that's talking to a Microsoft Active Directory database, and Microsoft makes an LDAP front end to that. So you could have a third-party product talk over the very common and easy to implement LDAP protocol to be able to check for usernames and passwords. Those weren't, neither of those were in here, by the way. There's no Kerberos here. There's no LDAP. Uh, if you're a Cisco environment, you may be using TACAX, which is technically now TACAX Plus. That's a very common way to authenticate. Again, not listed as a possible answer, or a very common uh, authentication method is through a AAA server that uses the RADIUS protocol. RADIUS is probably one of the most popular forms after uh, after Kerberos. If you, if you count Kerberos as part of the Active Directory, outside of that, RADIUS is extremely popular because it's open and available. A lot of devices will integrate RADIUS capabilities into it. So RADIUS is the one, in this case, we were looking for 63% of you chose RADIUS. It would not be IPsec. IPsec is used on VPNs to set up a tunnel, usually a site-to-site -site tunnel. It can be used to site-to-client as well. But that is not used for integrating user authentications with existing directory services. Neither is SSL. We usually don't integrate user authentications with directory services by using SSL. We may encrypt data that we're sending across the network with IPsec and SSL, but we don't use it to integrate user authentications because I asked you for the best choice. So even if you're going through an IPsec tunnel to get to the authentication database, that wasn't the question either. Make sure you parse out the question and get through those. Uh, STP, whether we were talking about spanning tree protocol or a shielded twisted pair cable, neither of those has anything to do with user authentications and existing directory services. And WPA2 is an encryption methodology used primarily on wireless networks, almost exclusively. On wireless networks, that has nothing to do with user authentications with existing directory services. If you answered C radius, 63% of you got that one absolutely right. Now, if you are watching this for continuing education credit, uh, what you want to do is go to the top or the bottom of the Professor Messer website. And uh, there is a Contact Us link right there at the top or the bottom of the website. You can click on that, and it will bring up a little form that you can fill in, put in your name, put in your email address, put in that this is the February 2018 Network Plus Study Group into the, the view that's there. You want to be able to have all of those things there. And you want to be able to give me the secret code word of the month. And the secret code word of the month is RADIUS. RADIUS is the secret code word. These continuing education unit certifications, I will email back to you. I'll digitally sign them and send them back to you. It usually takes me about a week or so. So a number of you have sent them in, and then the next day said, where is it? I'm like, I'm, I am not that uh, good at sending these back. This takes me a while. I'm a little lazier than that. So I have to sit down and go through them. It usually takes me about a week or so. Sometimes I get back to you the same day. Sometimes I get the big bunch in. I just try to get them out that same day. But usually it can take up to a week. Sometimes it can take a little longer. But, uh, be patient with me. If you really do think it got lost, you're more than welcome to send me a note. I don't mind you sending me a note saying, where is that? Or I need it for this thing, or I'm under time crunch. I'll absolutely get it out to you. Not a problem. Just let me know, and I'll be able to work with you. That's easy, easy, easy to do. So you get uh, one CEU for this session. It is a webinar CEU. 
I think for Network Plus, you can accumulate six of those in a three-year period. If you're working on your Security Plus, it's 10. I think if you're working on your A Plus. But many of you use these CEUs for other things as well. I get that. So I'll make sure I get them to you. And if you got multiples, put them all in one note. Send them to me. It's much easier for me to parse through them. If you haven't, that's cool too. I'll try to, to get them through. Now I'm able to, uh, there's a, by the way, I mentioned that uh, you need to watch videos, read books, get hands on, and try to try to study the details and get as much experience as you can with these, these questions that are going to be asked of you. GTS Learning has set up labs already to do things like this. I've got, here's a shot of the GTS Learning Live Labs. It's a special code that you could use to get the discount. So don't go to the GTS Learning website. You'll pay too much money. Use this link to get a discount that is automatically built in at professormaster.com slash netlabs. These are in a browser. They're a virtual environment, multiple devices that you're working with. You can hop from one to the other all through a remote desktop. It's so quick, it's so fast, and so easy. And don't pay $169, pay $109, which, by the way, comes with the GTS Learning book, which is the book that I used to create these videos and the book that they integrated my videos into. They also have, I think, 400 questions for Network Plus. So you can do that as well. Have a look at the NetLabs. Pretty nifty. Check out the uh, the information page, professormesser.com slash netlabs. And I want to thank the folks at GTS Learning. I've been working with them for years. They're great people to work with. You can always send them a note, ask them any question. They're more than happy to help you out. Professormesser.com slash netlabs. I think we got time for one more question. I want to get one more in before we finish up. And then we go to the open phone lines. Here's the question right here. Which of these would be the best way to increase the available bandwidth between two switches? Would it be A, enable STP, B, configure trunk port, C, set up lag, D, enable layer 3 switching, E, enable 802.1x? Which of those would be the best way to increase the available bandwidth between two switches? Enable STP, configure trunk port, set up lag, enable layer 3 switching, Enable 802.1x. We're going to, in a few minutes, open up the phone line. Stick around for that. I've got uh, also take questions from the chat room. So if you don't want to call me and talk to me in person, I will go through the chat room and we'll look at the questions there and have them all available. You can find out more about calling in. I don't have the call-in lines, call lines yet. I'll let you know when they're up. You'll just get a voicemail right now. If you're watching on a replay, you'll get a voicemail. But you're welcome to leave your question. I just may not be able to answer it very easily. You can always go to the top or the bottom of my website and hit the contact us. That comes directly to me, and then I can, if you're sending me a CEU, you can put anything in there you'd like. Always have those in there. Let's, if you an answer this question, professormesser.com slash QA. Let's see how we did with this one. It's another one we're a little torn over how we would increase available bandwidth between two switches. How would that happen? Well, let's see how we answered this one. Again, we didn't get a majority. 38% of you say configure trunk port. 24%, 23% said set up lag. 18% said enable layer 3 switching. 12% said enable 802.1x. And 7% said enable STP. Oh, how are we going to know the answer to this one? Well, this is, we do run into this one. This is a, a technology you absolutely need to know about for both your N10006, and I've seen it on the N10007 exam objectives. And the thing we want to know about is port bonding or link aggregation, commonly called lag, to be able to do that. That's whenever we run into how to make this technology work. We need this link aggregation because normally we're connecting switches with a gigabit connection. In fact, if you're trunking data through that, you're actually increasing the amount of traffic you will see across a link. Creating a trunk port doesn't add any additional bandwidth uh, at all. We've still got a maximum of a gig that we can use between that particular link. The way we would do it is to add multiple connections between those switches. And in the switch software, we tell it to aggregate those together to make it look as if it's a single port. So that's one that, that could be useful to have that there. Uh, and that way, we could say, if we need to go between switches, use this. And the switch will figure out where to send the data. It might use a round robin. It might set up different 
scenarios where it will send certain traffic down one interface and certain traffic down another. There's a lot of different ways to do it. There's a control protocol used for this. It's optional, but a lot of people will turn it on called LACP, Link Aggregation Control Protocol. It's not required, but it can provide a couple of additional capabilities for managing these particular links. And it, boy, will increase the aggregated amount of traffic between these two. Link aggregation is the correct answer. Setting up lag C, 26% of you got that one absolutely right. It would not be enabling STP. Spanning tree protocol will prevent loops, but it does nothing for helping us with bandwidth. Configuring a trunked port, as I mentioned, will allow more types of VLAN communication between, but it doesn't actually increase the amount of, tr of bandwidth available. Enabling layer 3 switching allows me to route, but again, doesn't help me with bandwidth between switches. And enabling 802.1x as an authentication protocol, maybe keeping people out sort of increases the amount of available bandwidth. Is that what we're thinking? That's not the right answer. That's not the best way. That's I did put in the question the best way. And although locking everyone out of the switch would really be the ultimate way to increase the available bandwidth, that's not the best way. You'll probably get a phone call. So if you answered C, set up lag, got it absolutely right, 26% of you. Um, this is, by the way, a question directly from the exam objectives. Make sure if you are studying for any CompTIA exam, your first thing should be to download the exam objectives. Before you take the exam in, the first thing you should do is go in and look at the exam objectives. You should be able to use this as a checklist. You should be able to know exactly where your weak points are. You should be able to understand everything in here. If you know everything that's in the exam objectives, it's going to be just fine. It's going to be great being able to have that there. So make sure. Uh, that you know everything that's on there. I do one of these study groups once a month. And I've got another one in March. We've got one on March the 14th is another study group. If you're watching this on a replay and you're way after March 14th of 2018, you can always check into the website. There's a calendar link right at the top, or you can go directly to it at professormesser.com slash calendar. You'll see exactly when the next live events are going to be. And you can join us and answer the questions live in Socrative rather than answering them after the fact in your head. Because Socrative is not available if we're not live. Well, if we come to the end of the first hour, stick around for the second hour. We actually went a little bit over for the first hour. But stick around for the second hour. I will answer some phone line questions. We'll get more detail in there. We've got uh, a lot going on with these um, the questions, uh, especially with Network Plus. Network Plus obviously changing over from the, the 006 to the 007. There's a ton of activity going on on this side. Make sure you keep checking in with us on Twitter and on YouTube. I imagine you'll start to see new, security, uh, new Network Plus questions or videos going up there soon. So it could be good. could be good to have that there. The important part, though, is that you're able to see them. So make sure you check in on YouTube or subscribe to the channel so you can get notifications about that. Don't forget about my course notes at professormesser.com slash NPCN. And also the folks at GTS Learning with their net labs. And join us. Check the calendar. You'll be able to check us every month and join us. We just thank you for being here. We wouldn't be able to do this without you being here and being able to answer questions with us. Stick around for the next hour. We've got questions. Maybe the next hour. We'll see how long my voice holds out. We'll see how far we can go with that. Stick around. But if you can't, I understand that well. We'll see you next time on the Network Plus Study Group. Okay, we've got uh, phone lines. I need to bring up the phone lines and have this here. There, right. Let's get this show started. Uh, la -da, da -da. One moment, please. You can see there's really, there's nobody here but me. So hosting a show, let's start a show. Let's turn it on. And I'll put a phone line up here so you can see the number as well. You can also see the phone lines at uh, professormaster.com slash live and see those well uh, for having them available. Um, let me bring up my view because I have to call into the phone lines as well to have this here. And let's uh, check this one, click that other thing, click here. I got a lot of things to click right now. 
Let me call into mine. Well, here we go, beep, beep, beep. It doesn't go beep, beep, beep anymore. I missed the Skype telling you beep, beep, beep on here. Line. Please enter your okay, uh, I will do that. I will type this in and a pound sign. Enter your six-digit PIN number. Well, okay. And boom, there's me. I think I am. Host. See? In the host room and See, I'm now in the host room. See how that works? Got all of those available. The phone lines, if you'd like to call in, 855-785-7545, toll-free number in the United States. If you are outside the United States, it's also a free number if you use Skype. So Skype, you put a plus one, 855-785-RJ45, and you can have that in there as well. And you can call in because we've already got people calling in. We should... Uh, We'll go straight to the phone lines, then we'll come back to the chat room. Let's go to the first call. What's like the 591 or another number there? Are you there, caller? What's your name? Where are you calling from? Are you there, caller? I hear you. Are you on mute? Are you? Hello? Oh, there you are. Hi. Hi. Hi what's your name? Uh, hello. I'm speaking from Bolivia. Oh, from Bolivia. Welcome. What, uh, what question do you have today? Yes, I, I, I passed the Network Plus exam the last week. And how did you do? Uh, great, great. I passed. Uh, the the course notes was very help, helpful. Nice. For me, uh, was was great, the, 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 the course notes. So I probably need to have some course notes uh, in Bolivia. Is it Spanish? Do I need to have Spanish course notes? Uh, that was my big mistake. I take the exam in uh, in Spanish, but I studied all all the materials uh, in English, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> well, it was confusing for me to translate in Spanish. A little bit different. You had to translate on the fly as you went back, as you went between the English and the Spanish. I'll have to get a translation done to help for next time. Very difficult for me. Because I study all the materials in English. Is there a particular set of topics that, without giving anything away from the exam, I don't want to, to to violate any of your candidate agreement, but are there particular topics that you would tell people, be sure you know these things before walking in the door? Okay. Uh, I I guess the, the very difficult part for me was the all the um, routing protocols. Uh, there are questions about what is the exactly routine protocol we need to use in a particular case. It's one of those things I think I mentioned earlier is they're not interested in you defining what STP is as a protocol. They want you to know how you use that to be able to solve a problem. Exactly. And having flashcards is great, but just being able to do a definition isn't going to help you very much on the exam. You obviously need to know that. You need to know that STP is spanning tree protocol, but you also have to go to the next step. What does that do for me? How is that going to help me when I start using this on the network? That's a good tip. Yes, that, 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 that kind of questions are in the exam. And uh, between uh, Question: I have the simulations, uh, but the, the first questions are uh, a scenarios. You have to uh, be sure what is uh, uh, the, the the acronyms of each uh, all the acronyms that are in the uh, Nero Plus acronym list. Mm -hmm. All that you have to know. This is one of those things that I think is is all over the place. In fact, I saw somebody online today mentioning. Oh, if you take one exam and you don't pass, when you walk in again, you're going to get exactly the same exam. Uh, you don't. Everybody's exam is going to be different. It's an enormous pool of questions. So uh, the, the things that we're talking about here, you might see on, on, on your exams. The people, other people are listening might see it on their exams, or you might not. Uh, what I really recommend is people go back to the exam objectives and look to see how much of each section is going to be covered, and maybe that would give you... Some ideas. Well, congratulations on your new Network Plus. What is next for you? Thank you. I, I'm a start to study in Security Plus. Nice. Uh, right now, I'm I'm a, I'm a student. I want to buy the, 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 the notes, but first I want to uh, watch the videos. Uh, start with that. 
I I don't know when I will call you in March uh, to ask you uh, which is come. I I uh, I have to take the 401 or the 501. You've got a kind of a choice right now too. The 401 is going to be retired. It will depend on which exam you take. The English language exam for the 401 will be retired in July. All other languages for the 401 will be retired in December. So it's going to depend on which one you decide to take. Uh, right now, there's a lot of material available for the 501 in English. I don't know if there's a lot of material available for the 501 in Spanish. It probably is. Um, but if I was, if I was going to sit down right now and choose one for myself, I would choose the 501 because I'm not that good at studying quickly. It takes me a long time to study. So I will usually pick the one that I know I can take in a year if it happens that way. And I know the 401 for me is going to be retired in July. The 501 I think is a little more focused of an exam topic wise. And I think it fits my, my study habit a little bit better. So that's the one I would probably choose. But look at both exam objectives. They're both available. And depending on your time frame, you might choose the 401 over the 501. It just depends on what your plans are. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the, the good notes were very helpful for me. And, and the books. Uh, I, I, I want to buy it, uh, a book uh, for a start selling. Fantastic. Best of luck. Congratulations on the Network Plus and best of luck with the Security Plus. I appreciate the call. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. That's, that's that is great news. That's, that's what you like to hear as somebody who's gone through it. Uh, people in the chat room are asking, okay, so we got this current N10006 exam. When is it going to be retired? We don't know yet. They, they haven't announced that it's going away yet. So we don't know when it's going to be retired. Let's just say six months from the beginning of March. That's I'm kind of going with that right now. Let's say that comes out on March the 1st. They usually give six months. That's when it would be retired. So we don't know that for sure. I'm just guessing at this point because the N1006 hasn't been even talked about retirement officially. Yeah, plenty of unofficial. And I get that. But I'm going with what's out there on the website. Let's go to the 804 area code. Are you there? Caller, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, my name is Jeff, and I'm calling from Richmond. Um, hey, I actually was going to ask a question about the uh, about the date of retirement, <laughs> but you just you just sort of covered that. Easy. Um, so I'll go on to my next question. I just had a, a few little quick um. Let me uh, see. You're going questions. to ask about cable types. That is really weird because that's exactly what I <laughs> no, had. No, it written. isn't. Um, yeah. So. So specifically, I feel so. I'm actually um, a security analyst, and I'm I come in and I decided I needed to expand my networking knowledge a little bit. So I'm taking the Network Plus first. Okay, good. Plus, good. And I pretty much whenever I take practice tests or anything, I get everything right except for questions specifically about cabling or questions that have very specific nuanced things about like 802.11 or right. something just really in depth things about certain wireless stuff and frequency ranges. And I was wondering if you had any recommendations. Um, I know you mentioned your, your NPCN link on your website that has the all-in-one sort of big PDF. Yeah. I think I might buy that. But And do you have any other additional recommendations for just getting those like rote memorization things down? Because it seems like you mentioned earlier that a lot of the questions aren't like flashcard based, like, do you know what this is? But with cabling, I, I feel like it might be a little bit in that realm of like you just either know it or you don't. I, I will have to say, as someone who has had sort of a practical career doing tons of networking implementations and tons of security implementations, I was surprised on the N1006 that there were so many cabling standards listed, especially for gigabit. You get into the short range, long range, and then the WAN and Sonnet stuff for gigabit that... We almost never touch on on the non-provider side of the world. It's almost like they were trying to lump in every possible scenario for 10 gig that you would ever see ever in any job. Um, this is one of those times where I almost say you should really look at the N1007, which should hopefully be here at the oh, beginning God. of the month, because what they did was get rid of 
the vast majority of those. I think there might be four standards listed on the 007 exam objectives. They got rid of the 10 and 100 gig stuff. It's gig and 10 oh, gig, wow. and it's copper and fiber, and that's it. It's the ones you're going to see in your data center, which is where they're focusing on. So make sure that you, you are able to find those and do something with them. The, um, okay. the, those, the Intent 006, it's more of a rote memory. It's, it's rote memorization. Some of the exam or some of the standard names sort of hint as to what they are. But if you had to write it in a fill in the blank, could you? It's kind of hard to, to look at it that way. Um, it, that is one of those that once you start using these standards after a while, you've implemented a switch, you've had to connect a data center together, you've had to plug in a WAN, you've had to buy equipment, right. you kind of learn what those shortcuts are, you know what those standard names are because you had to buy a product that could do that. Uh, but if you haven't okay. ever done that before, I can imagine that's a challenge trying to remember what all those different standards are. So this may be one of the few times I would ever tell somebody, eh, maybe you want to wait for the 007. Maybe that one would be easier if that's really what's holding you up. Okay, I will definitely consider that. Thank you for the advice. Um, last question. I hear you mention um, a lot in the videos that there's a chat, um, and I was trying to find it on your website, and I couldn't find the link. Um, is there any way that you could – Push that, up, push that up on the screen so that I could uh, get that link? If you go to uh, professormesser.com slash live, it's embedded onto the page. So it's just oh, under it the is. video. Okay. Just keep scrolling down. It's under there. Um, if, you, if you go to the website and you click on the number of students that are online, it brings up all the open chat rooms at the top. And there's a live event chat is what that's called. So you should be able to find it. So they are a little bit hidden on the screen. I tried to put it at least so we'd be able to find some of it. And once you find the one that's under the video, you can click the pop out button and make it its own window. You can move it to another screen. You, you got a little bit of flexibility with it. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Best of luck, Jeff. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. That's one of those challenges. Um, I, I kind of like what they've done with the 007 exam. I don't want to say stop what you're doing and take the 007. Start studying the 006 now. Almost everything is in the 007. There's very few things. I think I hit the two things today that aren't in the new exam, and those are relatively minor when you wouldn't be bad learning those things either. Um, but uh, the 007 exam, a much tighter exam. I like what they did with that one. Back to the phones. Uh, back to Florida, 561 area code. Are you there, caller? What's your name? Where are you calling from? Yes. Hi, Professor Messer. Uh, my name is Ed, and I'm calling from Miami Lake. Welcome again, Ed, in Miami Lakes. I, I Thank miss you. Uh, Main Street. I got to get down there eventually. What can we do for you today, Ed? Well, I, you know, I'm studying for the 401 exam and uh, keep track of uh, current events that are happening around oh, yes. the country and the world. And uh, the most recent article was about uh, Russian hackers um, exploiting some of the uh, contractors that work for the Department of Defense. Oh, yeah. And and apparently they were using, uh, it looks like, uh, spear phishing techniques to uh, target them. They're getting exceptionally good at and, that. Yeah, so I, I guess my question is, um, you know, besides training the personnel not to click on links and open attachments, right? wouldn't a... Wouldn't a spam filter would have uh, protected them from this? It could certainly would have filter, helped. It, it yeah, certainly, I'm just wondering, could a spam filter filter out uh, links and attachments uh, before it gets to their, your, their box? It is. There's a couple of ways that, that organizations are going about protecting against phishing in general, but spear phishing specifically. Uh, of course, what they're trying to do is they're they're sending a very – obvious question obvious email to somebody it looks legitimate it sounds legitimate it's not going to get caught by a traditional spam filter that's looking for the words gambling or bitcoin and just throw them into the spam box this one looks legitimate they're asking some type of legitimate question that deals with this person's job they may be mentioning a project they happen to be a part of there's something about the email that makes them trust what they're reading on the screen now, a lot of spam filters completely filter out attachments. The problem that you have 
and this happens even in the government and Department of Defense, is we use attachments to be able to send people important information. So it almost becomes impossible to filter out every attachment. There are spam filters that will perform uh, tests of those attachments. They'll check them and run a virus scan on them. Uh, in some cases, the most modern technologies will take those attachments, send them to the cloud, have the cloud execute or run or open that attachment in a sandbox, determine if it's malicious, and then inform the organization that an attachment has gotten through. Because that takes time. That could take an hour, could take a minutes or an hour, depending on what's going on and how the queue is. But they'll get a response back that says, an hour ago, we led in a file that we found a brand new set of malware on, and you're going to want to find that and stop it right now. So that's more of a heads up than you ever got before. The other thing that they're doing is passing these links uh, in the email through a different kind of filter. When you receive the email, they've changed the link so that if you ever click that link, it has to go through another check before it's ever let out into the world. So even though it says on the screen, click here to change your Google password, it's really going to a, a, dot, a dot .ru website. And when you click that link, it goes to a third party check that looks at it and goes, hold on a second. I'm not going to allow that link through. It's going to a dot .ru. Or they change in your email immediately and says, we've changed this link in your email because we found that it's going to a malicious site. This email has been marked as being something malicious. That's what they're trying to do these days. The bad guys, though, are setting up their links in Amazon's cloud. They're setting it up on Rackspace. They're putting it at legitimate websites. They're making it look legitimate. They figured out that they can't be fast and loose with this anymore. And they're finding new ways to get that information in front of somebody and then finding a way for them to click through or at least embed something on their machine. And part of the problem also is we continue to fight with these zero days or even unknown vulnerabilities that the bad guys know about and we still have it discovered. And they're using those a lot of times to get access to these machines without having to worry about any type of authentication and clicking. It's a constant battle. It's a constant race to be able to block and set up filters on things. And what they do is change their tactics and go around the filters that we have in place. Um, I think that's what makes security to me so interesting. That's why uh, the last uh, job I had working for someone else was a security type role for seven years. I loved it. It was something new every day, but it was also scary because there was something new every day. You know, when people, uh, I talk to people, I try to give them advice about what to do and what not to do. And I always tell them that if you get a an email from someone um, with a, uh, a link or a, an attachment, one thing that you should do is try to call, call that person and verify with them that they send you that information before opening it. Because, you know, just that double check would help. Because even if you get a, a, an email from someone you think you know, chances are maybe their contacts got compromised also. And yeah. now they're using their that information to exploit you. So if you simply call them and verify over the phone that it's a legitimate email, then you're much more safer to do it that way. The perfectly valid and perhaps uh, helpful uh -huh. type of thing to let somebody know because they're going to answer the phone and and tell you exactly what's up. And you don't. Most of the time, we don't trust these people in person. Why are we trusting them on an email? So uh, never. I tell people never trust what's in an email. Never, never, never. You have to be really, really, really sure in an email. It has to be an email you asked for it. You went to a website and said, send me an email with this information, and you got it. And even then, maybe you shouldn't trust it so much. It's it's a constant never trust, never trust, never trust scenario. That's all that security really is about. Right. So if it's unsolicited, then it's uh, probably dangerous. It's probably dangerous. It probably is. Most of the time, I could go through my spam filter right now. Everything in there is dangerous. I don't click anything anymore. I type, even if I see it in my email, I go and type it in on a separate screen manually. I never click through. I just can't trust it anymore. Right. Okay. Well, great. Thank you very much. Thanks for calling, Ed. Best of luck. Thank you. Oh, Mrs. Professor Messer grew up in that area of the world.
in Miami Lakes. It's a beautiful area. Let's uh, go back to the phone. Let me quick. Uh, we'll come back to the chat in just a moment. But people have been holding for so long from the 503 area code. Thank you for holding so long. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Let's see if they're listening to the link or they're listening in the phone. They're listening. No, oh, is that uh, is that the stream I hear? We never know. See, there's nobody that picks up and cl and clears all of these calls. I never have the call screener. Hello. Hi, what's your name? Where are you calling hey, from? Hey, uh, this is Matt, Portland, Oregon. Hi, Matt. Thanks for calling. What question can we answer for you today? Well, you know, every time I see somebody doing an example with networking, I see them doing it with Cisco equipment and. Yeah. I know you can just, you know, buy old third-party stuff, but I have also heard that Cisco has emulators on their sites that are available. Now, do you think that playing with some of this equipment, whether it's emulated or in real life, is going to give you, um, you know, good practical experience that you could use on the exam? I installed Windows Server on a computer at home so that I can learn more about VPN and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And it has helped me, but now it just makes me want to do the Security Plus because there's so many things about certificates. Right. You know, it's a snowball. <laughs> it is a snowball. <laughs> but, but what I'm curious about is, as far as networking goes, is playing with Cisco equipment going to help me out with this, you think? Cisco is as clearly, they have the market for networking. Cisco is nearly ubiquitous. They would like you to think they are completely ubiquitous, but even Cisco doesn't have 100% of the market. Uh, there are other organizations that have fantastic switches and load balancers and uh, and routers, and you may find some of those when you go to organizations. There are some organizations that are all Cisco and some organizations that are defiantly non-Cisco. It's almost a two different worlds that you'll run into. One of the things I like about the Cisco learning platforms that the the courses that they've got set up is that they spend a lot of time teaching the theory on these technologies. So let's take, for example, spanning tree protocol. They tell you everything there is to know about how spanning tree protocol works. You can use that knowledge about spanning tree no matter where you go. If you go work for a firewall company or a different organization that has a different set of switches and routers, you're going to know about spanning tree and the configuration of what you type in the screen may be different, but what's happening on the network is exactly the same because spanning tree protocol is a very standard type of protocol to be used regardless of what type of equipment you have. But Cisco is so well entrenched that it, it's at a point where if you are Cisco certified, even companies that don't have Cisco equipment will appreciate the certifications you have and consider that when you are applying to an organization. Obviously, it would help if you knew, if they had all Juniper and you knew Juniper, it would be great if you were Juniper certified. But that's a different conversation entirely. You were talking specifically, though, about how, how can we really put these things in a sandbox and make them play with each other? You could spend two or $300 and buy used equipment and stick it in a rack. And obviously, you're going to get exactly what you the same experience as if you were doing that in real life although it's a bit limited because you can only buy so much equipment you can only set it up so many different ways and do so many different things with it in fact it's it's limited in what you can see inside of what's going on you'd have to have a separate machine doing packet captures to be able to watch that cisco has recently in the past year or so made their packet tracer program which is their their emulator of the Cisco world they've made now made that available for free to anyone you simply have to like it's not totally free you have to register on the Cisco website they take a little bit of your soul but other than that it's absolutely free and you can download it and run it on Windows on Linux um, and you can kind of tweak it and run it on Mac OS but I found running it on Windows was so simple uh, you run it like a normal Windows program. It starts up, and you can simply drag and drop routers and switches and connect them in different ways. And you can stop time and put a packet on the network and watch it as it bounces back and forth. You can look at routing uh, tables. You can modify those. You can look at switches. You can turn on spanning tree. You can turn it off. It really is a remarkable front end. It does require 
that you have some Cisco knowledge. So there's a little bit of a ramp. There's a little bit of a learning curve to get into it. But once you start understanding it and becoming more familiar with the Cisco user interface, you can now start building things on the fly in minutes and connect up an entire infrastructure of routers and switches and watch it all run virtually and look at bandwidths and look at packets and everything else. It really is a great program. If you're studying for your CCENT, it covers about 95% of what you would need to know for the CCENT, probably about 90, 90, 80 to 90% 90 of what you would need for a full CCNA. Uh, once you get past the CCNA, Packet Tracer has, has limitations because it is an emulator in how it works. But it doesn't cost anything. You don't have to have licenses of code. Uh, it's a really neat program to play around with. It's a lot of fun to play around with. If you're really getting into networking, it's crazy what this thing can do and what they've been able to do with it. And uh, I highly recommend that people, if you have any interest in getting into, into Cisco, make sure you get Packet Tracer and play around with it. If you're studying for your Network Plus, it's a little bit overkill for Network Plus. It's not something that's required for you to get your Network Plus certification. But if you did it, if you use that as some hands-on, you would definitely know switching. You would definitely know routing. You would definitely understand spanning tree and some of these other things we talked about. And it's uh, and if you're really into it, it's a lot of fun, I think. Yeah, I just finished doing a bunch of subnetting. And uh, <laughs> it's been about a week watching and rewatching and reading and rereading. Yeah. And it, finally, I think I'm getting like 85, 90% of it. Uh, but it, this has been the most brutal part of studying for the Network Plus for me. Uh, even though I knew binary, uh, building that table and thinking about it in that way, it's entirely new to me. And so now that I've got that, going i didn't realize how important it would be and i studied through for the network plus and realized how many holes i had i studied so i've got the subnetting going through and now i'm like okay well I better relearn all, some some of the stuff about spanning tree and trunk oh yeah and some of the things and it seems like it's maybe kind of cisco specific even though network plus is supposed to not be vendor specific it seems like cisco equipment the stuff people are using to do this type of spinny tree trunk stuff like that so maybe i was thinking well maybe doing an emulator maybe it would help me learn that a little bit better i don't it, know it, it would it definitely would not hurt i'll i'll definitely say that spanning tree is the the implementation of that in the network plus exam is pretty broad and generalized but there are topics in 006 and i had probably a couple of extra topics in 007 that are cisco specific things because when you walk in the door, I'm speaking as someone who was a systems engineer that I went to uh, hundreds of different organizations every year. I would walk in the door, and out of those hundreds of organizations, they all had some Cisco. All of them, uh, I would say 98% of them were pure Cisco environments. And I think that's why you see that. I know Cisco's market share is much smaller than that, but when you're talking about the enterprise and very large organizations, there's just so much Cisco everywhere. So you start to see these very specific Cisco terms sort of get sprinkled into these certifications because you're going to run into them. You're going to see that type of technology when you walk in the door of these places you need to be ready. Well, I've been mostly Soho, and I still see uh, Cisco VPN concentrators. And the thing that bothers me is, uh, you know, I'm letting somebody else deal with that stuff. I, I think it would be very helpful for me to know more about how Cisco equipment works so yeah. I'm not scared to change configuration and be able to get into that Cisco equipment. Because right now, you know, I see it, I'm like, ah, I'm just scared of it. Just keep away. <laughs> this is sort of the thing I, it's, it's a common thing in both networking and security. And I'm speaking as someone who spent uh, tens and tens of years in a career doing tons of networking and tons of security is that you never, never, never know everything. It is a constant knowledge transfer. That's all you're doing all the time. No one person can know everything there is to know about configuring a Cisco router because there's you get into BGP and OSPF and load balancing between those two and doing router, uh, router uh, redundancy protocols. And it's too broad. Nobody can be an expert on every single one of those things. So you do run into scenarios where you're just constantly reading. But 
people are just getting into networking sometimes feel overwhelmed that how could I possibly ever learn everything there is to know about all of these things? Well, I got news for you. You're never going to know everything there is to know about all of those things because it's impossible. What you need to know is focus on the things you need to know at a very broad level and then start doing deep dives on things that interest you. And once you become the expert in those niches, you're going to find you've got some very valuable skills that you can use in a lot of different places. I ended up buying some Ubiquity brand stuff recently and uh, using it at home. And it, it seems like uh, they've got command line interface. Uh, they've got, there's a lot, uh, there's yeah. a lot that it can do. Yep. And I was really impressed uh, for like Soho stuff, stuff where you don't have thousands of dollars to spend. Uh, it seems to do some of what you would normally spend two to five grand for right. in, you know, if, if, if say a client, you know, had more money and, uh, uh, I'm trying to learn a little bit more about that. Cause it looks like their 10 gig stuff, their fiber stuff you yep. know, is coming in hundred bucks, 200 bucks, 300 bucks. And, uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe that's one to keep an eye on too. So sometimes these companies like Cisco, uh, they make a new technology, they're first to market, and they can ask for a lot of money because they're the only ones out there. And then everybody else catches up and the market changes dramatically. It's sort of the circle of life in networking. Well, that uh, I'm trying to trying to learn a little bit about everything. So at least uh, I feel like I can proceed to the next level because uh, this uh, it seems like there's a lot more to learn for Network Plus than than with the A plus and I'm trying not to, to rush things too much because uh, you know, it seems like there are a lot of uh, broad questions. So thanks for answering mine. Absolutely. <laughs> thanks for calling Matt. Bye. There is uh, and I think it's an important thing. If you're somebody who's getting involved in security, you need to know networking. You need to know a ton of networking. Uh, back to the phones, 978 area code. Are you there? Call. Thanks for holding for so long. Well, there's something going on there. Caller. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hi, I'm Steven. I'm calling from Danvers from Essex Technical High School. Hey, there they are. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for calling. What question do you have? Uh, have you seen the CompTIA pen testing exam? I haven't seen the exam. I think it's in a beta right now. I saw the exam objectives, um, and they're exactly what I would expect from a penetration testing exam objective. Is that something that is interest uh, for you and others there? Um, yes. Um, oh, hi, Professor Messer. It's a whole class of ninth graders that we just watched your video. It was great to see. Thank you for watching. <laughs> we. You're welcome. We have a few exams we have to take. We're preparing for IT fundamentals right now. Excellent. And and uh, the penetration test exam, by the way, is uh, it's coming soon. And I tell people, if you're going to get into security, I was just mentioning this uh, on the last call with Matt, get as much fundamentals as you can. Get as much understanding of the operating system and as much understanding of networking as you can. Um, it is... Uh, when you look at security, it's nothing more than taking all of those things that you've learned with setting up a computer and understanding the CPU and working with the memory, adding on a networking piece, and then layering on top of that all the security pieces you need to know. So the IT fundamentals is a great place to start. That's awesome. We were hoping to do that, A+, plus, and hopefully, possibly some Kali Linux, and wow. hopefully that would prepare us. This is the best class ever. I never had classes like this in ninth grade. This is going. This is a thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Messer. Thank you. My teacher is Elaine Bastard. So if you see that username, she's your biggest fan. This is uh, uh, honestly take these things that you're learning here and apply them to the things that you're going to see. You're going to get into. You know, the rest of high school, you've got things going on in college. Find a college. Uh, not all colleges out there are able to take advantage of these types of knowledges, but some are. Look for those diamonds in the rough out there that understand IT today, and you'll be able to take these things you're learning now and apply them through everything else you do the rest of your life, quite honestly. Um, it, that's a remarkable class, and uh, best of luck to you.
Wow. Thank you so much. This was exciting. You're awesome. <laughs> I appreciate you okay, calling. We'll let you go. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. Best of luck, everyone. Thanks. Bye. That's that's uh, encouraging. That's something I wish more high schools would do. Because the the if I sort of like learning a foreign language, if I had just spent some time when I was younger learning the foreign language, it wouldn't be so difficult now. It's the same thing with technology. And if you can apply the technology to what's going on, the Ethernet that we're doing now at 10 gig and higher speeds, it's pretty much the same Ethernet I was working with in the year 1996. So there, we just made the cables different and it's a little bit faster. The packets look very similar. The frames look very similar. The way spanning tree works today, almost identical to the way spanning tree was working then. Why wouldn't we get those fundamentals down now and be able to use them through the rest of our career? It's, uh, it's, it's a fantastic thing you're doing there. Let's go to phone lines 410 area coder. You're their caller with your name. Oh, I hear me. I hear me, and now you hear Hello. me. Hi, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Uh, my name is a, my name is a Ken. I'm calling from Columbia, Maryland. Fantastic. What's your question? I have a question on the uh, Security Plus exam. I overheard you saying that uh, the 401 version was going to be absolute soon, and then we're starting a new 501. Yep. That's correct. Are you studying for either the 401 or 501 yet? I was studying for the 401. And that you're as long as you're planning to take the 401 exam and get it finished before July 31st, you're in fine shape. Take the 401. There's tons of materials out there for it. There's plenty of books. All the videos are out there. There's plenty of study materials. And people who have taken this exam over the last three years who can give you ideas and comments about what you can do to pass. If your plan might take you past July 31st, then you might want to reconsider and stop now and begin studying for the 501. But it retires in uh, at the end of July, so set your calendar and your schedule accordingly. Okay, so the 501 and 401, are, are the materials semi-similar or very different? You know, most of the time when CompTIA does an exam upgrade like this, they are very similar. For example, on the Network Plus, between 006 and 007 are remarkably similar exams. But this time on the Security Plus exam, the 401 and the 501 are very different exams. I would say the content is 50% different. Half the content is brand new on the 501 exam. And I'm speaking pretty accurately because I just finished the 501 videos. They're very different. That's why I tell people, make sure you study for the right one. I might go ahead and study for the 501, I think, because it's a more more recent version. I, I agree. And I, th I kind of like the layout of the 501 a lot better. I like uh, some of the topics they added. I like some of the topics they removed. I think it's a tighter exam, and I think it applies more to what people are doing in security. I think it's a tighter exam. Now we get to hear it. Let me say that. Okay, so you wouldn't recommend that I, I don't need to get any more, like, textbooks and stuff, right? Like the... All your textbooks and all the materials you study from need to match the version of the exam you're going to take. So if you're planning to take the 501 exam, your book needs to say on the front, 501. It should not say 401. So make sure you get that one right. 501. Okay. It should not say 401. So make sure you get that one right. Okay, okay. I'll do that. All right, good luck to you. I appreciate it. And thanks for calling. That's a that's a good thing to go through. Well, we've come to the end of another another set of calls, call in lines. Thank you, everyone, for calling in. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your Q&A you spent with us today. Uh, we've got another one of these study groups for you next month. Feel free to check the calendar online. We've got another one next week that's on Security Plus. So if you like this one and you want more Security Plus stuff, come on next week. Same time, same place. We'll do another one of those. Thanks for joining us, though, on this one. We will see you next time on the Network Plus Study Group.